The following is a recording of Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. For more information, visit gpts.edu. Look at John 1, verse 18, verses. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There came a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light, so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. There was the true light, which coming into the world enlightens every man. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory as of only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified about Him and cried out, saying, This was He of whom I said, He who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for He existed before me. For of His fullness we have all received, and grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time, the only begotten God, who is in the bosom of the Father. He has explained Him. Let us pray. O oh, grand, glorious, triune God, You are enthroned in all beauty and splendor, dwelling in light unapproachable, and yet have caused that light to come into the world and by the Spirit to enlighten your people. We thank you, Lord, that you have enlightened us. You brought us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of your Son, from darkness to light. We thank you, Lord, that you uh, are teaching us about yourself, that we might grow in grace and that we might instruct others. Particularly, Lord, those who are here preparing to serve you as office bearers in the church that you will greatly equip us and by the Spirit illumine our understanding. Give us a good grasp of the truths that we will discuss tonight. Help us to teach and learn in dependence upon the Spirit of Christ. For it's in Christ's name that we ask these things. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> through the uh, results of mediation, calling, justification, sanctification. Get into the person of the mediator? Yes. I right, did we finish that? Okay, as, as way of review, um, who remembers the, the four theological arguments from the larger catechism on proving the deity of the Son and the Spirit? All right, names, attributes, works, and worship. Now let's look here at John 1. And, uh, you know, we always uh, talk about Christ being revealed here as the Son of God, but take, those, that, take that paradigm now, look at John 1 briefly here, and come up with uh, verses out of John 1, 1 through 18 that would demonstrate each of those things. Your facility to do that is going to help you when you witness particularly to witnesses and Mormons and such of that book. I like uh, verse 14. Uh, just a minute. Uh, just just a minute and I'm wanting everybody to have time to write down there for. Oh, gotcha. Okay. 
And you'll be number one, though, okay? Who is that? I didn't have four yet, so don't make me number one. Well, <laughs> you can do your first one now. You're supposed to know that. <laughs> Names, attributes, work, and worship. All right. I know some don't have four yet, but who was that out there that wanted to offer one a while ago? Uh, that's Caleb. All right, Caleb, give us yours, please. All right. Um, I like uh, verse one for names. Um, also, I want to say it calls him light, um, verse eight. Um, attributes, verse 14, was one I particularly like for glory. And I want to say that ties well to, I think, is it the verse in Isaiah that says, you will not share your glory with another? That would almost be uh, worship then, wouldn't it? I think yeah. I would tend to put glory under worship, particularly because of a verse like that. Definitely. Um, works, I like verse 3, um, all things were made by him. Uh, verse 10, um, the world was made by him again there. And then uh, worship, I was kind of, wasn't sure I actually was in verse 15. Um, that he was preferred. Good. Um, so that was my four. All right. Anybody have some others besides those? We kind of grabbed the whole chapter, didn't we? You got eternal in verse one. Uh, and then again in verse two in the beginning. It was the work of creation. And the work of illumination. The one that gives grace and truth. And to have seen him as to seen the Father. So it's rich, isn't it? I mean, you just take, you normally think you got to go jump around. But. Right here in the prologue, the Gospel of John. And then we took uh, some of the arguments from before. Why you know he was a man? Well, didn't we really talk about that? Did we last week? But it's something good to think about. The fact that he became flesh be regarded as one of the attributes. Okay, I didn't, not necessarily from this chapter, but just again prove that he was a real man. Hungered and thirst. Tired. He's tired, exhausted, sleep through a storm. Wet. Wept. He had emotions. Yeah. All right, so we, clearly in Scripture, he's revealed in his divine nature and in the human nature. Born of the Virgin Mary, had all the properties of human nature, all the infirmities of human nature, the uh, catechism. Uh, under his humiliation. Uh, he uh, suffered the indignities of the world and infirmities in the flesh. So we had a discussion. Have you all decided where we were last week yet? I failed to make a mark here. I thought we were on chapter three of the mediator, or close to that. That's where my bookmark was. No, we are. That's what I'm doing. We're in the mediator. We just dealt with the yeah, person. Paragraph, Paragraph, three. Three. Paragraph yeah. three. That's a bit different from chapter three. Okay. We had not done the large catechism questions, so uh, 37 through 39, I don't believe. Yeah, the last one. 
that's why I remember touching on this the very beginning of 37. Yeah, all right. So we, we talked about the hypostatic union, that he was one person with two natures. We did? Just mentioned it. I just mentioned it. All right. All right, so um, well, I didn't more than mention it. I talked about the language from Chalcedon here in paragraph two. The problem is we're exactly where the Christ and Salvation course is right now as well. <laughs> of course, that's all we're talking about for three weeks is the material that's in this chapter. So, all right. The Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, being very eternal God and of one substance equal to the Father, we've done that, did when the fullness of time was come, took upon him man's nature with all the essential properties and common infirmities thereof, yet without sin. Now we did that. And not only was he without sin, that he could not sin. Being conceived by the power of the Holy Ghost in the womb of the Virgin Mary. We talked about the Virgin Conception last week. Of her substance, and that's very important, of her substance. There are some that would say, well, the Spirit just kind of passed the this human body of Christ through Mary. But see, if that were the case, he could not have been our covenant head. He had to be of her substance so that it would be of our substance. All right, so that the two whole perfect and distinct natures, the Godhead and the manhood, were inseparably. What does inseparably mean? Okay, so what about now? Okay. Join together in one person without conversion, composition, or confusion. Which person is very God and very man, yet one Christ, the only mediator between God and man? So that's what's called the hypostatic union, from the Greek hypostasis, which means person. And so this is the union in the one person of the two natures. And they were held distinct from one another. That's the language that reflects the Council of Chalcedon, the Chalcified, that's a good one, Chalcedon Chalcified, um, this doctrine dealing with the eras of Nestorianism that said that he was basically two people, an actually good man who eventually received a, a god in some way, or Eutychianism that said that he was basically essentially a divine being. Uh, and so Chalcedon you know, worked this out. And what Smith's language is, there's no conversion. And so he wasn't turned uh, into one or the other. So it didn't, he didn't become a man. He didn't become God. He was the God man. Uh, composition, that now he is made up of uh, these two different things to become a, a third entity. Or confusion, that's just kind of two thirds of one and one third of the other, or whatever. So those three words basically summarize some of the heresies that you'll deal with in ancient church, and then again in Christ and salvation. So why is it important then that he uh, be God and man and act in one person? I think we got to everybody last week. So, we'll go back up here. That's right, Mr. Blizzard was going to be gone to Canada. So, Timothy, why, was it in, why is this doctrine important? This hypostatic union he is one person and two natures. Um, well, he had to be truly man in order to be the second Adam, in order to truly represent us. Um, and he had to be truly God to, uh, to have the perfection needed. Okay. To, uh, Good. I use two S's to help people. He was the suitable Savior and the sufficient Savior. Suitable he was our representative. So Hebrews uh, says that he had flesh and blood, or blood and flesh. Uh, made like us, not like angels, like the seed of Abraham. Uh, but could one sinless, perfect man atone for billions of people? He could only atone for himself. For two people? No. no. 
He could offer his life as an atonement for one person, if he went to hell forever for that person, to kind of tailor two cities. But uh, he, uh, it's impossible. So, sufficient Savior, he had to be God, which then gave, and we'll see why in a moment, divine attributes to his suffering and enabled him as the person to suffer and to uphold him then in his suffering. So, uh, 37, Roger Kennedy, 37, Christ, Son of God, became man by taking to himself a true body and a reasonable soul. We did talk about that, didn't we, last week? Um, conceived by the power of the Holy Ghost and the womb of the Virgin Mary, of her substance, born of her, yet without sin. Why was it requisite that the meter should be God? So here's the sufficient. It was requisite that the meter should be God, that he might sustain and keep the human nature from sinking under the infinite wrath of God. In other words, this mere finiteness could never have withstood. And the power of death. Give worth and efficacy to his sufferings because he is infinite and eternal. The person then is going to have those attributes. And thus, all that he did as the person would have infinite eternal quality. And to his obedience and intercession. And to satisfy God's justice. So he would have to be able to do that in a divine way to make it an eternal offering. Procure his favor, purchase a peculiar people, give a spirit to them, conquer all their enemies, and bring them to everlasting salvation. So you see the wisdom of God as he works his whole plan of redemption to bring all glory to himself, but all the stuff that, that is necessary so why was it requisite that he be a man? It was requisite that the mediator should be a man, that he might advance our nature, perform obedience to the law. So advance our nature, Athanasius says that in the fall, human nature began to expire, so to speak, deteriorate into corruption. Well, here, our, our, our nature is, going to, is advanced in Christ. Our nature is now in heaven. Perform obedience to the law, as the mediator suffer make intercession for us in our nature he have a fellow feeling so he's the perfect priest that we might receive the adoption of sons have comfort and access with boldness unto the throne of grace and then why was it requisite that he be god and man in one person the requisite that the mediator who was to reconcile god and man should himself be both god and man and this in one person that the proper works of each nature might be accepted of God for us and relied on by us as the works of the whole person. So this language, the proper works of uh, each nature. So he's acting uh, according to both natures. Let's skip through. So the um, acting according to both natures, look at paragraph seven. Which gets moved to page thirty eight. Christ in the work of mediation acts according to both natures, by each nature doing that which is proper to itself, yet by reason of the unity of person, that which is proper to one nature is sometimes in scripture attributed to the person denominated by the other nature. So this is called in English, which is all we'll do today, the communication of attributes. Don't confuse this with, uh, Josh, you want to give them the Latin and Greek? No, no, okay. They don't, Lutherans also have a communication of attributes. We actually say there is a communication, a true transfer of Christ's omnipresence to his human nature. That's why he can be present at the Lord's Supper, uh, physically. Uh, it's called ubiquity. 
But the traditional Reformation doctrine of the uh, communication of the attributes is because he's one person, the attributes of the human nature can be applied to his work, and the attributes of the divine nature can be applied to his work. So speaking as the person, the God-man, he says, I'm thirsty. And there is a, a human attribute applied to the person. And of course, in Acts 20, verse 28, uh, the church is purchased with the blood of God. And so there you see, because he's the person, even though the blood was shed in the human uh, nature, it's as if the person did it. And so the attributes can be spoken of one or the other uh, that reinforces that point. So that is how in the unity of the person, he then accomplishes this. Each nature acts according to itself, paragraph seven, and then what we read in large catechism 40. Uh, and each nature acts according to itself and because of the unity Sometimes one nature is spoken of as if it is the other. Communication of attributes. All right, now in paragraph three, we get the qualifications for the office of mediator. The Lord Jesus in his human nature, thus united to the divine, was sanctified and anointed with the Holy Spirit above measure, having in him all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge whom it pleased the Father that all the fullness should dwell to the end that being holy, harmless, undefiled, and full of grace and truth, he might be thoroughly furnished to execute the office of a mediator and surety, which office he took not unto himself, but was thereunto called by his Father who put all power and judgment into his hand and gave him uh, commandment to execute the same. And so then why was he called the Christ? 42. He was called Christ because he was anointed with the Holy Ghost above measure. And so set apart and fully furnished with all authority and ability to execute the offices of a prophet, priest, and king of his church in the estate of his humiliation and exaltation. And the short of catechism is just in the created version of, of that. So what qualifications were given to him, uh, Mr. Dwyer, uh, as mediator for this office? Qualification. Well, um, the confession notes that he had all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Okay. Uh, he was anointed by the Holy Spirit and sanctified. Good. All right. So he had all the treasure of wisdom and knowledge, uh, which and he had the Holy Spirit above measure. Uh, so he was fully anointed by the Spirit. Thus the Christ, that's the Messiah, that means the anointed one. So his very name says if he's anointed and he's been anointed by the Spirit in a way that no other person, so he's been set aside and anointed by the Spirit and given then all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And what's one more thing here? All the fullness, fullness, the fullness of the Godhead, Colossians 2. And so uh, as the person, uh, the fullness of the Godhead uh, is in him for the office of mediator. Uh, what are some of the attributes given to him then? Mr. Rizal. Sorry, Dr. Piper. Oh, good. Um, so they cite Psalm 45, 7, where it says the oil of gladness, the, uh, God hath anointed him with the oil of gladness above his fellows. Mm -hmm. um, and I honestly have always struggled with what exactly, I mean, obviously it's saying he is exalted above other men um, in his anointing. But what does that, is that speaking of his holiness and his, and his perfections? Is it speaking that he was brought by that anointing above where he was originally? Well, I, I think that it's basically uh, talking about he received the Holy Spirit without measure above all his fellows. That's the way John would take it then. Without measure being that we have an anointing of the Holy Spirit that is limited. Limited. 
This is unlimited. Okay. Yeah, that's how I take it. All right. Give Matthew time to think. <laughs> <laughs> Good. All right. So he's got four of these divine attributes that are communicable. So he's uh, holy. And why was that important for the mediator? The appropriate sacrifice. All right. Harmless. A true Israelite in whom there was no guile. Undefiled. Again, parallels the lamb or the goat that had to be pure without blemish, full of grace and truth, so that he's the one now that communicates grace and truth. So that's one set. Uh, thank you, Matthew. Timothy, what uh, else is uh, here as qualifications for him to be the mediator? The Father conferred on him power and judgment and the commandment to execute. All right. So... He was thoroughly furnished, but what's the very next thing then? That he was called to it. All right, he was called to it. Um, that uh, which office he took not unto himself, but was there unto called by his father. Hebrews 5, 4 and 5 says the priest could never just take the office for himself. He had to uh, be called uh, by the father. So he was called by the father. And the second thing he mentioned, he was given all power and judgment. So he says this in John 5, that the Father has entrusted his work into the hands now of the Son, and then gave him the command to execute, again, John 5, the justice of God. He will judge, he will raise the dead, he'll cause them to hear his voice. Uh, the commandments he was given in that eternal transaction where God chose his people in him, and the Father laid down the responsibilities of the Messiah unto that end with full authority and power. So he's a fit mediator by his nature. He's a fit mediator by uh, his uh, divine and human uh, characteristics and attributes and calling. All right, next we come to consider paragraph four, which gets us in really to the, the meat of this uh, section. It is uh, on page 38. This office the Lord Jesus did most willingly undertake, which that he might discharge, he was made under the law, and did perfectly fulfill it, endured most grievous torments immediately in his soul, and most painfully sufferings in his body, and was crucified and died, was buried, and remained under the power of death, yet saw no corruption. On the third day he rose from the dead with the same body in which he suffered, with which also he ascended into heaven, and there sitteth at the right hand of his Father, making intercession, and shall return to judge men and angels at the end of the world. So here we are introduced to uh, this glorious concept of uh, his state of humiliation and exaltation. Briefly summarized in the Shorter Catechism, um, 27, wherein did Christ's humiliation consist? Christ's humiliation consists in his being born, that in a low condition, made under the law, undergoing the miseries of his life, this life, the wrath of God, the curse of death, the cross, and being buried, continuing under the power of death for a time. Our larger catechism 46, the estate of Christ's relation was that low condition wherein he for our sakes, I love the way they play off each other, uh, emptied himself of his glory, took upon him the form of a servant in his conception, birth, life, death, and after his death until his resurrection. Do you recognize the passage of scripture in this answer? Right. Philippians 2, 6, uh, through 6 and 7. Very good. 8, um, 6 through 8. So, 
That's the first division. The second we'll do it in a minute. Then is this exaltation. So, um, what do you think it means? He most willingly undertook uh, that he might discharge this Joseph. Uh, that there is no grudging at all. That he was in one accord with the will of the Father. Okay. Uh, I, uh, Psalm 40, verse 6, he's come to do the will of the Father. This will was revealed to him in his mediatorial covenant capacity in eternity when we were chosen in him and the whole plan was laid out of what he would do, what the Father would do, what the Spirit would do. And he then willingly undertook this under no compulsion. And so the shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. It's not taken uh, from him. So, and then it goes on to discuss his humiliation. So now, um, what larger catechism does in 46 is give us the survey of humiliation. Jim? A question about the phrasing of the larger catechism, specifically here, the idea of emptying himself of his glory. Philippians, at least in the translation I'm reading, just says emptied himself. How do you... Well, a glory is an interpretive phrase, but that's what you do in theological doctrine. No, I understand that. I guess my, my, the reason I ask is because there's a note in here from when Dr. Hartman took this class. It says, uh, kenosis <laughs> theory that Christ emptied himself of deity right. as opposed to the idea that he veiled his deity. How does that extend to his glory then, whether it was veiled or emptied? Well, that's exactly it. By veiling his deity, he veiled his glory. So he made his glory not appear, except on occasions. So the divine glory was veiled. Am I good? Yeah. I was not going to talk about kenosis, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, regarding like the structure of the confession. But before we do that, let's just a bit about kenosis theory. It was started in the 19th century, and it's K-E-N-O-S-I-S. And uh, they believe that Jesus, uh, when it says emptied himself, that he actually uh, uh, gave up divine attributes in, this, in his person as the mediator, particularly omniscience and omnipresence and omnipotence, uh, which then would be totally, it's another Christological heresy that would fall against the hypostatic union. And so uh, the word there, uh, empty is from the Greek word kenao, and from that we get the kenosis. But that word is always used metaphorically. It means to make oneself of no avail, uh, to repudiate oneself. And so he repudiates himself, and, the, and that's why the, I think this language is very good, of emptying himself of his glory, so that he hid his glory, he veiled his glory, uh, and so he would not be recognized in his exaltation. David, you were going to say something? Um, not to start with controversy, but I think <laughs> um, there are uh, major churches that hold to that, like uh, Bethel, and by extension Hillsong, uh, who hold to that theory. Really? Um, and I know that at Bethel they teach that Jesus was not God, but he was fully man while he was on earth because he emptied himself. Hmm. And so I say by extension Hillsong because they part of it. Bethel but what? Uh, Bethel Church out of Reading, California. What do you expect? <laughs> <laughs> Every fruit flake and nut in the world to come from California. The great agricultural country. Thank you. I did not know that. I appreciate you. Uh, and so, did any of Hillsong's music uh, lyrics reflect this? Um, I know that. That's way out of my ballpark. <laughs> um, I'm not. I'm not sure because it's vague enough where it can reflect any kind of doctrine. Um, but I know that uh, the teaching pastors, all the teaching pastors of Bethel, uh, they teach that. Well, that'd be a great, great paper for Christ and salvation. <laughs> if you want to change your mind. Bill Song is here? No. <laughs> but, yeah, because, because they're not, because they don't, Bill Song doesn't officially take any stance on anything. Um, it's always safe. It sells a lot of music. <laughs> but I, I, I know music for that, all cults, heretics. <laughs> but I know someone that went to the school of supernatural ministry over at Bethel, hmm. um, and it's basically the the doctrine is they teach that Jesus completely emptied himself of all divinity so that he is fully man, and 
And so they well, craft glad, their songs. I'm glad you brought this up, Mr. Fronte. They craft all, all of their worship songs. There's actually somebody the today that has nothing to do with the songs. So. So it's sad because I have uh, back in Miami a lot of friends who actually are involved in churches that use um, that music, female song music, which centers around a theology that is based on heresy. And why would this be stirred up controversy? Well, I don't know if people still listen to that full music here. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter. They need to know what they're listening to, huh? Yeah. I can listen to Peter, Paul, and Mary, but I know who I'm listening to. <laughs> Y'all wouldn't know who they are, but uh, they were great. Somebody to play. I, uh, along, actually, my question was... Feel about music. Hillsong, but you as a musician. Music lines also. <laughs> I, 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 I couldn't recognize them. <laughs> Just the name. Um, and can it be? I think I'm going to go there. In the third verse, yes. after himself of all but love. Yeah. I, I've always had a hard time with that verse, but well, can we take it allegorically? Or no. Not allegorically <laughs> it's a word. story here. Okay. You know what a story? The story is... Uh, because I was uh, one of the holdouts. I was on the Board of Trustees of Great Commission Publications. I did not want the New Trinity Hymnal because I knew what kind of influence was going to be coming in. So they made me and Dr. Rayburn theological editors from the PCA. So at the end of the day, we met with the two OPC theological editors, who shall remain unmentioned, but their names are in the front of the hymnal. <laughs> And here I'm all excited, oh man, this is going to be great because we've got two conservatives on our side and we can really... Well, they were opposed to everything that we wanted. We wanted to put stuff back in, the good stuff, they wanted to take it out, and all kinds of stuff. It, it, it came out being, a, I would say, a 90% good, useful hymnal. Not, the Psalter hymnal is superior, uh, partly because it has the Psalms, partly because I learned this weekend they, put in the middle verse to God beyond all praising, which is absolutely glorious. That was already one of my funeral hymns. And now it fits even better. But well, back to the story. So this is one of them that I flagged uh, for discussion. I said, this is canonic, and we, we got to change these words. Well, the other side, well, no, it was just metaphorical. Everybody, you know, Wesley wasn't. Well, I don't care what Wesley was. This is what the words say. We don't have poetic license. So I actually edited it. Uh, humbled himself. Uh, no, no, you use the word. It's humbled himself of all but love, something like that. Humbled himself so great is love. So, so great, yeah, yeah, humbled himself so great is love. So that was what we put in the place. But now what's interesting is is to sit in these older congregations that have been singing the old yeah. for years, and I'll sit there and watch. Yeah. You know the words. Will have been changed. People will sing "Empty Himself of All But Love." Yeah, that's yeah. The way it is the but that's, that's sir. I think that's the way it's in the Baptist hymnals. Oh, it is. It's all hymnals. We were the first one. This is, is not copyrighted. We could change it. Yeah. And uh, was the was the Blue Trinity empty himself? Well, I don't think it's in the Blue Trinity. It oh. is in the Blue Trinity Baptist edition. Well, it's in the other one too. Then. <laughs> well, yeah, they let probably let it fly. Just missed it. Uh, strange. But uh, that's why you have theological editors. But that was, another one was on the atonement. So uh, uh, we got a couple of the died for all out of there as well. So I'm sitting on watch people while we're singing, you know, and they sing the wrong words. That all may go in. So. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, which gets to just, this is totally off subject now, but <laughs> uh, the importance of the words of what you sing. Arius promoted his heresy by, he made up jingles, scripture courses. And people were going around singing these catchy tunes and imbibing his heresy. So it's very important that we guard what our people sing. And sometimes it means, oh, it's not just that the first two verses are good, but sometimes I shut my mouth on the third verse. And that was in the New Trinity Hymnal. I don't, haven't had to do that yet in the Psalter Hymnal. But I don't want to sing error. And you know, just because two of them were good, the other one could, it's just ambiguous, so I'd rather use it. You know. But be careful when you get in the position of being the one, Mr. Dwyer, who gets to select the hymns, um, that 
that you do so with, uh, with great care. And that's why I, I, I really pushed the Salter Hymnal. My, my wife and I, had, Woodruff Road got it, uh, and my wife and I were given some copies. We let a bunch of hurricane refugees stay in our house, and they left us five hardback and one nice leather bound to company. So we've been using it at family worship. We'll do a psalm one day and a hymn next. Not every day, but it, it's just, uh, they made some tune changes and stuff like that. I like the other version of 98A. They kind of messed that up a bit. but. Uh, no, it's very good, and you can. I enjoy claiming worship by the new Trinity hymnal. <coughs> this is just a, a good step above. Well, there more in that, Justin. On a different track, we're back to confession. Oh, good idea. <laughs> <laughs> I, I noticed that in the confession, it's sort of structured after the Apostles' Creed, but it leaves out the dissent clause, but the larger catechism mentions that. How is that? We're getting there. <laughs> we're getting there. Well, know, before we like leave paragraph four behind. It didn't. It doesn't matter that the dissent clause is not necessarily what they're. They're given very brief summaries. So. Well, it's the fact that it's not mentioned that is. No, it's not because I said the documents are going to change. They stand not separately but together. And so each one, so here, uh, they simply wanted to give a, a quick overview of humiliation. Now, in larger catechism, as I was about to say, but before I got us off track, our kenosis did, uh, that the larger catechism then divides the steps down into humiliation. And so this is the exposition now of the confession. So, 47, Christ humbled himself in his conception and birth. Now, how was that humbling himself? He didn't have to get in the beginning. All right, being from all eternity, the Son of God. The Greek Orthodox uh, teach that Christ would have become incarnate. It was not humiliation. He would have become incarnate whether or not Adam had fallen because he was the true image of God. And that's part of the theosis then, so now it will be made over in his image divine. But uh, no, it was humbling for him to take our nature and to be born of a woman who is eternal. Um, Advent hymns, you got to avoid most of the 19th century ones, but the early church, the Reformation, and the uh, uh, medieval church, Advent hymns are really good. And Luther's got a couple with the paradox of the the God who rules the world being held by, by in his mother's arms. It's much better language than that. But, uh, those are the kind of things that uh, grab you. So anyway, um, in the bosom, he, so he was in the bosom of the Father, just a way to express his equality with God, yet not a thing to be held on to. Became the Son of Man, made of a woman of low estate, and born of her with diverse circumstances, of more than ordinary. So, uh, Joseph Hom, what does that mean? Of more than ordinary basement? Yeah. The, well, he was born in a manger. All right. To basically a peasant girl, a carpenter and his wife. Yes, sir. They were poor. So he could have come in a different state, but this is what Matthew's getting at when he would be called a Nazarene. It's simply lowly, lowly, abased. All right? He humbled himself in his life by subjecting himself to the law, which he perfectly fulfilled. Now, how did he subject himself to the law? He is the law giver. Mr. Horner. Yes, sir. Well, um, how did he subject himself to the law? Is that the question? Yeah. It says Galatians, he was born under the law. That means in subjection. So he had, right, so he had to fulfill um, the law for, for his people. The lawgiver had to do that for his people. Okay, the lawgiver had to do that for his people. All right. It's covenantal. So yes, he kept all the law, not the ceremonial law, 
but now as the covenant head, he has to be under the law uh, and keep it in, as a public person in our place. Thank you. That was good. Um, then, conflicting with indignities of the world and the temptations of Satan and the infirmities of the flesh. So indignities of the world, what would that be? Caleb. Um, would that maybe relate to him working as a laborer, whether that was a carpenter of some kind, um, having to work for his food, things such as that? That's or an indignity? You got a low view of work, son. No, no, I mean, just that the idea of he sharing in that, the sweat of the brow. I mean, the, as far as not that the work is bad, but that the curse of the... Okay, because uh, you simply said work or having to get his food by work or stuff like that. Yes, the curse on work, the the, the sweat, the, uh, the, the difficulties there, as well as the mockery. That would come. That came to him, unbelief, even his own family, for some period of time, and uh, uh, so the world's insult, the world's rejection. He came into his own. We came to the world. They didn't know him. He came into his own, the covenant people. And they didn't know him. That's the indignities of the world. Of course, the temptations of Satan. Uh, he was tempted at all points, as we are, infinitely more than we are, and thus he really knows and understands temptation. Now, what's the infirmities of the flesh then, Caleb? Well, you may, I think you talked briefly about it, uh, the argument of whether he could have gotten sick or not. Yeah, I, I don't said we talk we about that conclusion. tonight. I said, oh, sorry? I said we talk about that tonight. Could Jesus get the common cold? Or the flu? Uh, infirmities, yeah, as well as sickness but hunger, um, cold, hot, I mean, all those sensations well they're a bit different there are sensations that are involved in his humanity so cold hot tired exhausted um, Adam would have worked probably would have slept and eaten but he never would have been in a um, difficult state because it would have all been joyful and painless so we'll have a poll Theology by democracy. <laughs> <laughs> so how many think that Jesus could not have gotten these common childhood illnesses? Raise your hand. Sin boldly. All right. Uh, let me hear you guys out there. I need to bring up the roster, don't I? Anybody out there that thinks that Christ could not have had common childhood maladies or whatever, speak out now, name yourself, and cast your ballot. This is a recorded ballot, no Democrats hiding behind the veil of uh, anonymity. All right, I'm going to take this now that all of you, this is quite amazing, Andrew, Caleb, Eric, Jeremy. I kind of want to say yes, just to be different. <laughs> yeah, that's... That's Who's what I'm that? gonna do. I'm gonna say yes. You're different. <laughs> Two <laughs> contrarians. Name yourself. Jeremy Andrew. is one, and Andrew was the other. Uh, Caleb as well. Oh. Well, guess what, guys? You get to defend that position. <laughs> and then we'll have uh, we'll have Josh defend the uh, classes position. <laughs> which is his and he's already thought through this a number of times already so it better really be top drawer you want a smiley face don't you? okay y'all elect somebody Jeremy, Andrew, or Caleb I just elected Jeremy <laughs> I knew you would do that man um so, uh, I, I, uh, it's, it's something that I've been studying about, and, it, and it's, it's, I haven't really actually put my grasp on it, to be honest with you. 
Uh, Andrew, you want to try? What did that? I'm wondering if somebody else wants to try. You're not doing your friends a very good job up there. <laughs> I'm not, I know I'm not. What about, uh, it says here, it says infirmities in his flesh, whether common to nature of man or particularly accompany that his low condition. So the second one. It depends be, on what, who the his is <laughs> in this sentence, but. It's all Christ. It's, connected to the it's man, all Christ. Okay. And, uh, you're defending the wrong side of the question, though, aren't yeah. you? That's exactly right. Infirmity is common to man. What kind of cold was that called? Common cold. Uh, now, there are theologians and good ones that would say that uh, uh, the Christ would not have had these typical uh, maladies because that they were all a direct consequence of sin, and there's no sin in hell. And so only when he went to do the atonement did he then begin to identify uh, with sin. But then he's a high priest who sympathizes with us in all of our problems. So I don't know it's a matter of orthodoxy. I prefer to think that the Savior, with his true human nature, made the likeness of sinful flesh, which means he had all the infirmities uh, of, of a fallen human nature without being sinful. Wouldn't he have to be considered the spotless lamb? Because there's like, he couldn't get a broken bone. So he's a national infirmity. A lot of young boys have broken bones, climbing trees. Jesus never broke a bone. And so if he's the spotless lamb to be offered up, maybe he didn't get colds, so he would remain the spotless lamb in a natural way. And that was one of the arguments we had last hour, wasn't it, uh, Josh or somebody? Yeah. Um, so he couldn't break his bone when he was the lamb offering. But does that mean that a 12 year old when he was not the mediator, he couldn't have broken bone? Was he always the mediator? He was only the mediator when he was anointed at 30 and then appointed to the office. Dr. McGraw told us he was anointed at birth. Dr. McGraw says from eternity, that's what's at the OPC. Set aside. No, he's well. Being anointed. Yes, but then also like the Holy Spirit came on him when he was in the womb. Oh no, the Holy Spirit created him in the womb. Yeah, I didn't say, he, but the anointing, becoming Christ, took place at his baptism. I'm sure Dr. McGraw would agree with that. He said it was the most obvious and visible anointing. Right. Right? Didn't he say? I'm not. I'm not going to get it. It's public. You guys are hair. Why not? <laughs> yeah, I, I do think that the way Dr. McGraw presented Maybe it's just it, the way he presented it. I, I mean, no, it seemed like he would be in conflict with what you were saying. Because so people said, like, at the baptism, and he was like, weren't there other times? Like, yeah, that's the most was, obvious. But the word but anointing is not used any other time. Well, if he has the Holy Spirit without measure, when did he get the Holy Spirit? It was uh, according to John, he got it in his uh, adult ministry. Okay. Should tell him that. <laughs> he had the Holy Spirit. But, um, <laughs> I, I had a thought of broken all of this, all of this is humiliation uh, is in his office to the mediator. <clears throat> So on, he participates in the stages of manhood so that he can redeem all of the, all, all of men. Right. So yeah. that might be that he's getting a different thing. Right. Um, might not be the next thing. So he might be, <laughs> the confession says he might be thoroughly furnished to execute the office of mediator right. and surety. But the Holy Spirit was given to him, to, as we say, well, I'll go to, without measure, that he might be thoroughly furnished to execute the office of a mediator. So, uh, his work, no, of, his uh, work uh, of mediation, I, I, don't, I don't think he did his work of mediation until he entered public into his ministry, because he was called. This is my beloved son, whom I'm well pleased. But he identified with us at every stage of life, 
and was tempted as we are, so that as a priest, he is able then. And of course, he was upheld by the Holy Spirit of the whole time. But being upheld is not quite the same as being anointed. Yes, sir. Who is that? That is Sean. Sean, you've been strangely quiet. Um, yeah, sorry, I, I apologize. I've been quiet. I had a cost of a work call. Um, but uh, at this point, it's way overblown. I was going to make a joke about how he definitely didn't cry as a baby, um, but never mind. <laughs> That's another one we got rid of. Do we? Away in the manger. Yeah. Away in the manger. That's still in the Trinity Hymn, wasn't it? We couldn't. That was one that we lost on. In fact, I think there's two versions of it. Docetic. <laughs> That's docetism. Docetism is what? We talked about that last time. He appeared to be a man, but he wasn't really a man. Oh, I bet this and ladies in our community would love to have one of those kind of babies. Would you <laughs> like one of those at the house, Josh? <laughs> <laughs> Okay. They, they removed it from the Trinity Psalter. Oh, I know that. As I said, it's it's superior. It had all agreement among its theological editors. That was an eye-opening day. Would you say the position that Christ could not have had the infirmities like a cold or broken bone or something, they're pulling that from Psalm 91, particularly Satan pulled that on Christ in the temptation, saying the angels will will come to you, lest you dash your foot against the stone, and amongst of other things that the righteous one would be protected. Right, but that was kind of a death situation. Right, well, and you were talking about, you know, yeah, since his calling that may have been so, but and growing up, his human nature was probably more, um, probably experienced more than common. Well, nature. and Satan would have not, Satan knew who he was, obviously from Herod's attempt, and then that's interpreted in, in Revelation chapter 12. So, as a child, he didn't have to be anointed to be the mediator. To, to, Satan would not try to kill him, as he did with Herod, kill him with a fever. I don't know what all he could try to do to uh, to, to kill him. That was his intent as, as long as he could, and he did. It was a big mistake. All right, good. That's good food for thought and. A, a joke and a terrible hymn on top of it. <laughs> That's more than you pay for. Huh? All right. So, and then the uh, uh, next part of, of that uh, humiliation again is, my page has got turned somehow. There we go. Uh, in his death, Christ humbled himself in his death and that having been betrayed by Judas, forsaken by his disciples, scorned and rejected by the world, condemned by Pilate, tormented by his persecutors, having also conflicted with the terrors of death and the powers of darkness, felt and borne the weight of God's wrath. He laid down his life in offering for sin, enduring the painful, shameful, curse of death of the cross. So there we have what he did then in terms of his immediate um, work of atonement, crucified, dead, buried, remaining dead, but not decaying. Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Bob, I had a question on the last one, actually. Um, I think we might have touched on it briefly last week. This is Caleb. Um, in the temptations, can you comment on the distinction as far as some people claiming that Christ would have had a, a homosexual temptation um, and why that's not possible? Yes, uh, because that temptation is, cannot be divorced from a perverted nature. Paul's quite clear about that in Romans uh, chapter 1, and that's where everything goes astray. If you define uh, sodomy, which is the time-tested, honored biblical phrase that was used until the political action group started in the 20th century, you know, as Orwell points out, you define the language and you can control the whole thing. So I use the word sodomy, and uh, it doesn't make me very popular, but that's okay. Well, that's and nice and, nice and loving and gentle. So, you know, somebody, a prospective student told us the other day that uh, you know, he was told, you gotta watch Dr. Piper, he speaks softly, but he's dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a compliment, you know? 
If I can be kind and soft and yet dangerous. <laughs> Anyhow, so no, he could not have been tempted to, because that temptation, uh, it's Satan acting on the lust of the flesh. So none of Christ's temptations would have come from within. Because he says in John, uh, John 16, that evil ones come for you, but he has nothing in you. No place to put his claws. And so, yeah, that is blasphemous. I've heard of that. And it is just simply, uh, uh, as I said last week, he could be tempted to look at a woman and think she's attractive and godly and it would be nice to be married to her. Okay, that's not wrong. Those are not wrong thoughts. Now, what he does with those thoughts, that's where temptation comes and, and sin. So can you, um, if you have the time for it, um, the passage in James, I've had somebody question me on that before, as far as that, uh, where it says every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Um, so can you, it, maybe you've already answered that question, but is that the idea that it was only an external temptation, but that he never acted upon it is why he did not sin in those temptations? Well, they wouldn't say that he sinned. What I'm trying to say is that particular temptation, to, the temptation to look on a woman and to admire her and then to go to the next step. Well, I'd say if I'm married, I'd like to be married to her. I just follow the, the seventh and tenth commandment in my thoughts. Uh, but the, to look at her and admire her beauty and godliness, uh, there's nothing wrong with that. So, uh, but... The homosexual problem is not, it doesn't begin with uh, that awful description we had at General Assembly where when I was in a, in a wedding and I couldn't take my eyes off the ring bearer. Well, that's absolute corruption. That's perversion. And that's a nature. That doesn't, Satan doesn't have to tempt, you see. That is a perverted nature acting. So uh, James is another, another good proof text to show that uh, uh, these lusts drive out of perverted natures. They don't come. That's why Jesus couldn't have, have had them. Is that satisfactory? If I got that last question right or not? No, yeah, that's excellent. That was, that was the answer I was looking for. I'd seen it clarified once before, and I wanted to hear it uh, verbalized. I don't even read excellent. it on the internet. So. I'll get a smiley face. <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather have other gifts. I'll tell you in private what they gave me in South Africa. Um, so, he knows no shame. All right, so uh, then he was dead and uh, buried. Let's get back into the confession kind of that close. So in his death, and then the fourth thing is how where he consisted of humiliation after his death. His humiliation after his death consisted in his being buried, continuing in the state of the dead and under the power of death until the third day, which hath been observed otherwise, ex which hath been expressed otherwise in these words, he descended into hell. And we often forget that burial uh, was part of the punishment of sin. It was a humiliation. It was the it was the final blow, so to speak, of the, uh, the penalty of sin, which is death. And burial then s seals it. And also, he was buried to prove that he was truly dead, continuing in the state of death under the power of death until the third day. Again, to prove that he really endured, that he didn't faint away, he didn't pass out, he was dead and yet no decay. Now, this last expression, where's this found? Apostles. It's in the Apostles' Creed. Anybody read Calvin's explanation of this in your reading? I already gave it. That was last hour. No, it's not. Okay. <laughs> uh, he, he treats it as um, that Christ experienced hell on the cross. He takes it as a statement of apposition. 
So it summarizes everything from the previous uh, crucifixion, <coughs> suffering God's wrath, justice, all of that. How does the confession of faith take it? Beard. And uh, it's important to understand, at least from my perspective, as I understand the words, Hades in the New Testament and Sheol in the Old Testament uh, are negative terms. Now, the grave is not a negative term for a Christian, as Paul points out, for example, in, second, in, in 1 Thessalonians 4. But these two terms always look at the grave negatively because it stands for either the gravest, death and gravest punishment and the place of everlasting damnation is punishment. That's why they're connected. That's why the one Hades for hell is reflected in Hades for the grave. And Sheol for hell reflected in Sheol for the grave. So I think linguistically the confession is on a stronger footing here uh, when it says that this has been expressed and ascended into hell. That is the burial and remaining in the state of death, not in the burial of uh, the believer who sleeps, but the, the one last uh, affliction of uh, uh, punishment on the mediator. So either position uh, is, uh, neither one holds any error. It's hard to know exactly what this, this phrase was added later uh, in the development of the Apostles' Creed, but it's pretty much universally accepted in Reformed churches now. And uh, the few churches that take it out, you know, I really wish I was raised in a Presbyterian church, an old Southern church that was conservative, not that Reformed, but conservative. Uh, and, and they took it out. But uh, I think here you see, for example, and the Presbyterians at the assembly wanted to use the creed the way the Heidelberg later, earlier used the creed. And it was the independence uh, that kept blocking the, the uh, use of, of the creed in the direct creed worship. And so they just sneaked it in right here. So <laughs> there was a hand. Oh, I was just going to mention, uh, it was mentioned last hour too, that in defense of Calvin's position, Jesus says that people the cross, today you will His soul, no, his soul didn't go to the grave. That's not defense of God's position. His soul went immediately to heaven, but his right. body suffered the uh, yeah. punishment of sin in Hades or Sheol. Right. Okay. Yeah, I understand. Is, that, is Hades actually used in the Greek in the original Apostles' Creed? I would think so. There's no other word. Gehenna and Hades were the only two words. Also, that was a weird translation. I think Mr. Freintag will come to Apostles' Creed in Greek. Try it. <laughs> the internet. Or Latin. So is the catechism saying it's like hell, like where unbelievers go? Hell? No. It's talking about the grave as part of judicial okay. punishment. So that would be a third option that you no. would not agree with? No. This I agree with. Right, but the third... No, there's only one other option I know of, and that is that it's an apposition to uh, the previous question. Well, I just always read it thinking that it meant hell, hell. Hell, hell. Never. Well, hell, hell is in the previous section. There are people, there are people that teach that Jesus was, went into hell and... Yeah. Like the first Peter. The yeah, first but Peter. okay. We don't... We can go there if you need to. If anybody's plagued by that one. Josh will answer it for you later. <laughs> Last class. Uh, this Christ, uh, by the Spirit, was preaching through Noah to the generation that then, when Peter wrote, was in hell. But he couldn't in his soul have gone to hell because he told the thief, today you'll be with me in paradise. So that position, the only two positions that send to hell uh, that are orthodox are that either it is picking up on what's in the previous um, how he humbled himself in his death and that's where he felt and borne the weight of God's wrath laid down his life and offering for sin etc uh, and that's what Calvin <clears throat> so crucified dead and buried 
descended into hell. And there is weight to what Calvin says, and even as I say it, I think about it, because this is then what he endured for atonement. And so descending into hell could summarize a theological summary of, of this, those statements, that he was crucified dead and buried. But what happened? He was crucified dead and buried. He just said, I just maybe convinced myself of the position. Um, they're both true, but uh, yeah, they're, and they're both. So the Heidelberg Catechism follows Calvin uh, on, on that as, as well. So pastorally, if like once a month, your congregation recites the Apostles' Creed and it says he descended into hell. The majority of the people in your congregation are going to believe that Jesus went into hell. Well, now this is your past speaking, son. This is not. Kind but of... I mean, do you think most people interpret like Calvin does this passage, or like? Well, I think that what's supposed to happen is that periodically, the pastor will explain. Holy Catholic Church, descend into hell. That should be done periodically as we make that confession. Gives an excuse to talk about it. Huh? Gives you an excuse to talk about it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, could we, I mean, if, it, if it's so, the, the Catholic is just King James English that we can't. No, it's not. Oh, um, we use the word universal now. Often. Yeah, Catholic's so much better. We are the Catholic Church. I, <laughs> no, we're not going to go back there. We, but, we'll get there in a while. But that whole phrase is, in one sense, requires, like, again, so many qualifiers to instruct people so they're not misled. That if, it's, if someone's not told what you mean by it on the surface, they're going to believe, in one sense, a heresy. Why have people read something like that that would most likely confuse them? Well, I mean, you read passages from Scripture that I sure confuse the same people that you're not preaching on. I mean, the point of a confession, though, is to be clear. Like, these are the... So you explain points. it. But not every time. That's what I'm saying. No, we should. And we get... To, if you don't flunk out, you get to the worship course. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about leading worship. We should be explaining everything we do. I mean, you got to realize we're so counterculture that if a visitor comes in off the street, uh, he'll think we're from Mars. And so we need to be explaining a lot of things. I agree with you. To do it without explanation is not pastorally wise. But I wouldn't cut it out. This is time honored. You know, over a thousand years of language that the Christian church has used. And I don't think people have been that naive for that period of, long period of time. You got to realize that sin to hell is a relatively new dispensational teaching too. It just started in the middle of the nineteenth century. It's not again. Nobody would have had this even had this question if a little minority of the church hadn't. Uh, and so we do have to address it now because of that. But before then, they wouldn't have had to address it. Really? Yeah. This is a dispensational teaching that Christ went to hell. Were you raised with it? Was a young Christian. I had never heard of the apostasy of the young Christian because it was assumed to be very Catholic. No, but were you, ever, were you taught in your teaching that Jesus went down personally into hell? My mom said that, yeah. Huh. I, I don't know if I was raised taught that, but I grew up thinking that. I don't think I was taught that so much as... I'm, that, sure, that, you, that, I'm sure you were not taught that. <laughs> and if you were raised in the catechism, but, you should have known that. It, it is partially because of what Joe was mentioning and reciting the Apostles' Creed every or every other Sunday and saying he descended into hell and that's just what he thinks. That's good. Well, that I'm teaches sure. us a good pastoral I'm lesson. Sure. Yeah, it doesn't appear to be Hades, actually. But I was I was saying there, it looks like there's two versions. One uses Hades and one uses kat, uh, yeah. Katotakos. And their yes. lower parts. There mm -hmm. seems to be Philologists who claim that that's the older yeah. form of the Greek. Well, the lower parts would still fit. <coughs> the grave is a place of punishment. That, yeah, that goes back to the Psalms. Hebrew is Sheol, right? It's interchangeable. Like the yeah, so. It's what's used in Ephesians, where Paul says he. Um, 
But what, okay, yeah. Sheol, though, would always be translated by Hades, I think, in the Septuagint, but maybe sometimes a little bit. And I was actually going to say, I've heard people defending the theory of Christ descending into hell using that phrasing from Ephesians of the leading the captives out as being he physically went, you know, in or solely went. I don't know. But he couldn't saying. leave them out. I don't. They're in hell I don't forever. disagree. I'm just saying, I've heard people <laughs> use that. But what the dispensationalists say is that he went to that in between place, that holding house. Well, Calvin dealt with it. And, yeah, Calvin led, led them out of there. Yeah. Whatever it is, yeah. So, we're not King James only here, so we believe like one sense that the language of the Bible should be updated to the people. The Apostles' Creed's originally in Greek. If it is really just to the lower parts, should we update the language of the Apostles' Creed for our people so they could understand it in a better manner to be, and he descended into the lower parts, which would be in line with? One of the lower parts would be as confusing. I mean, I hear lower parts. I mean, think a naive person would think he went down to hell. And just like he was buried. Well, no, it's it's a summary of all of it, dead and buried. But then you have something to explain that the grave has two connotations. The grave is either the place of rest for the believer, or it's a part of the punishment of sin. And when it's called Hades. And I would think if lower parts ever translate shield, that's how we'd understand it in the same way as, uh, as a judicial. Uh, the other thing is, and you don't, I mean, I know that, for example, New Trinity Hymnal, did it modernize the Apostles' Creed? I think. It, it's changed a, a very slight little bit, and I can't remember why. You see, that's, a, that's a, again, an ecumenical creed. I don't think a hymn publisher has the right. Uh, and a denomination ought to be careful uh, when it starts uh, monkeying with 2,000-year-old uh, uh, language. So same with the Lord's Prayer. I'm very much committed. I'm not a King James person at all. I love the King James, but I fight against it being used in public worship. I wouldn't want to change the Lord's Prayer, though. I've played with the idea and put you in there and, and whatever, but it's just memorable and, you know, it's, it's clear. It doesn't need explanation too much. I think, um, I think the, the fact that we live in a culture that's theologically, uh, there's theological famine when it comes to language, um, I think it does provide us an occasion to go ahead and pastorally educate the people. Um, because and that's what we, Ken said. It's not yeah. to teach every week. And, and, and that's to his point. And I think that if we begin taking that position, then words like propitiation and expiation are going to go out the window as well. And it becomes a slippery slope. You know? and so I think that, you know, that I think the updating of language comes down to the teaching methods of the pastor. Or yeah, and, I th and that's why I think Joe's point is very good for us pastorally, for you all to keep this in mind, is that um, the way most people lead worship today, it's just like roller skates. And people, I mean, I preach a lot in the Free Reformed Church, and they get kind of shocked when I talk them through worship, you know, and say, because our sins have been forgiven, we're now going to sing this hymn. And little things like that that we should do, not just for that phrase, but we should regularly be talking people through worship and then use the opportunity to explain different things, different words, and, and what because it's not just that one phrase that confuses people so much. So I think your sensitivity is right on target. And I just feel the contrast I get to propitiation is nobody knows what propitiation means, that's why I have to define it. People think they know what help means. And that's the danger, is that if you don't define it, and that's the trouble with the King James, like you don't realize that you don't understand it, because word meanings have changed. And so if you're going to say descended into hell, there's more of an importance to say it doesn't mean he went to hell like unbelievers do. It means... What he's saying, the same people would understand propitiation, huh? I don't think so. No, they, would, no, they don't want to say anything we do. Josh? I just... Jesus did experience the full and complete wrath of God in the same way that unbelievers do in hell. 
So, in a sense, why does it really matter that we have to define it that clearly? I know it's out of order in the Apostles' Creed. But, but it's, it's not. It's either a summary statement, it's not out of order, or it's the conclusion of the last death and burial. So, I think it's in good order in either place. Yeah. I, I don't know. If, I mean, just to, for somebody to think that Jesus did actually go to hell, it's not really dangerous, is it? It's not. Yeah, what's he doing? But he did go, he, in a sense, he did go to hell on the cross. Yeah, but that's not what the dispensationalists think. They think that his soul and body, or at least his soul, went to the prison house of the damned and was tormented by Satan then for the two and a half days. Yeah, that's different. Well, that's, <laughs> that's what they're picking up on. That's, that is a, within a narrow sphere, a popular teaching. You hear a lot of radio preachers probably do that. So, yeah, that, that's why. And again, it's all a matter of knowing your culture and what are the things that people are going to think um, by what's being said. So you want to instruct your congregation so they're able to interact with the other people as well, which is the best way not to do it. So when Christ rose trying to in the grave, he broke the, the sting of death. What exactly is that, or the, the sting of the grave? And the fear and the judicial aspect of it. Okay. So death and burial no longer have a sting. They're no longer judicial. They're no longer one more attack on, uh, and so the catechism will say that death is actually <coughs> a blessing for the believer to pass into glory, sinlessness, and the body rest in the grave in union with Christ. I was just going to say, the Greek word is used, or derivatives of that same Greek word are used in Septuagint and a number of places to talk about what we would call Hades, like interchangeably with that language. So okay. I don't think Lower that, places? Yeah, I don't think that the Greek word is used in some form of the Apostles' Creed necessarily necessitates reading it as what we think of as hell. It seems like a pretty interchangeable. Okay, good. Thank you. I learned something too. All right, so. Uh, that's the state of humiliation. You meditate on these things. This helps you to grow in your appreciation of what the Savior has done for you. And then we have the state of exaltation, which is, we're given the summary statement in 52, so I won't read that now, because then we have in 53 uh, through 56, the, uh, again, the steps. Now we had descending steps into humiliation, and it's through humiliation that he ascends into glory. And they're completely connected uh, in his mind. And so when the Greeks come, we would see Jesus. He says, now is the time for the Son to be glorified. This is the cross, and he's going to be glorified. So how was Christ exalted in his resurrection? 52. Christ was exalted in his resurrection and that not having seen corruption and death for which it was not possible for him to be held, so he's kept from corruption, having the very same body in which he suffered with the essential properties thereof, but without mortality and other infirmities belonging to this life, really united to his soul, he rose again from the dead the third day by his own power, whereby he declared himself to be the Son of God, to have satisfied divine justice, to have vanquished death and him that had the power of it, and to be the Lord of the quick on the living and dead. All which he did as a public person, the head of his church, for their justification, quickening and grace, support against enemies, and to assure them of their resurrection from the dead at the last day. So the first step of his exaltation is the resurrection and uh, We've got the significance. Calvin in 116 gives the threefold significance of it, full atonement, mortification, and the hope of our own resurrection. And we see that here as well. Notice as well, in the same body, and that's true for us then, uh, there is going to, there is, because the body remains in union with Christ, it, it decays in the box, but it also can be lost at sea, burned up in a fire, or whatever. 
but because the God man is in his divine nature, the, in the triune God, are omniscient, uh, they know where every piece of your DNA is, and they will bring back that body. And it won't be a newly created body. That's part of the of the wonder of the resurrection. It's going to be. Isn't there some kind of scientific theory that nothing's ever lost? Not Energy all. doesn't dissipate. Matter can you be created or destroyed? Just the right. theoretical. Law. So theoretically, it's there somewhere <laughs> in the belly of the fish or whatever. So. He's going to bring it all back together. It's quite remarkable. And I love the way the Catechism puts it. And Rick and I have talked about this at Grave Science, is that the, the soul ascends to the presence of God where it's glorified, and the body rests in the tomb in union with Christ until the resurrection. He wasn't just the Savior of the soul, Savior of the person. And so his resurrection then is our his vindication, justification, is the declaration of our vindication and justification, as well as the hope of glory uh, that we have in Him. Do we have time for another tangent on cremation? It's auditor. That's a good one. Uh, that's what I mentioned. So we're going to fall behind and, and just have, have okay. an extra class, but that's okay. Uh, this is good. Uh, I'd rather get these practical questions. So what about cremation then, if the body, this is way off the point. Uh, <laughs> so I said what it was. Remains in union it's, it's not a burning question. We can pass it off. I'll give you my oh, answer. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you my answer. Thank you for your permission. I'll give you my answer, and then we'll talk about it later. We will get to uh, that in, maybe, we'll get there at the end of the semester. Uh, when I, I teach the students of worship at a graveside, do a little homily on Abraham's burial of Sarah. The only piece of land he ever owned was a tomb. He buried her because of the sure and certain hope of the resurrection. Those great words out of Cramer's prayer book. And so we're making a testimony when we bury. That the body has also been redeemed by Christ and is every bit as worthwhile as the soul. Unless we treat it with reverence. We buried in this way then. Now, I wouldn't exercise church discipline. I pastorally, I teach on this, and I encourage you guys as pastors to teach on this. If somebody has chosen to do the other, you, know, you can try pastorally to lead them away from that, but you don't want to make a big issue out of it. Particularly at that time of life when you may bury somebody. Uh, pragmatically, it's a lot cheaper. <laughs> but here's an opportunity to make a, a confession. And we want to talk about that. We'll come back to the uh, our resurrection, and we can bring it back up again as well. So how's Christ to be exalted in his ascension? The ascension is 40 days after the resurrection. He was exalted in his ascension, and having after his resurrection often appeared unto and conversed with his apostles, speaking to them of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, and giving them commission to preach the gospel to all nations. 40 days after his resurrection, he in our nature, beautiful, see, the human nature, as our head, triumphing over enemies, visibly went up into the highest heavens, there to receive gifts from men, you can see the language of the Ephesians, uh, to raise up our affections thither, for there is our Savior, to prepare a place for us where himself is, and shall continue till his second coming at the end of the world. And so by ascension, um, he's glorified as the God-man, and it's a declaration of victory. So I, I call, uh, when we do this in more detail, the resurrection is the victory, ascension is the victory parade. And so here's a great parade. The conquering general is going forth, and he's taking captivity captive and giving gifts to his church. Uh, and uh, then he gives his commission and receives gifts then for the church. So it's a great truth. Uh, Again, it's a truth that we should preach. I'm opposed to having liturgical calendars, but I think that we should preach these things. So Josh is 28 years old, and he's heard 28 sermons on the Ascension. At least. At least. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, uh, trouble is there on Thursday. <laughs> but periodically in our exposition, we, we should highlight these great truths. Pentecost, Ascension, 
are his great historical acts of redemption. I don't think we should celebrate any of it. Because I know that there are churches that have their Easter Sunday and then 40 days later they have Oh, yeah, no. Uh, yeah. I don't think we should be celebrating Easter. Every Sunday? Lord's Day is a celebration of the resurrection. And so I'm very opposed to celebrate. Now, as I said in the last class, Martin Lloyd Jones, I'm just quoting him. It's two times a year people come to church thinking what you're going to preach about. Don't disappoint them. <laughs> You've got an advantage. I mean, suddenly they want to hear something on the Advent. I'm going to preach on the Advent. Not on Christmas Day, but one Sunday closest to it. I'm going to preach on uh, the Sunday that's called Easter, uh, making the point that every Sunday we celebrate Easter, but uh, it's a great historical redemptive truth, and it's a good day to preach about it. Now, often we preach Old Testament prophecies, so just to give people a, a little bit of a curveball. Uh, to get them to think about what is, is going on. So I would do those two pastorally. I'd break a series and do it normally. Um, but I would periodically uh, uh, preach on the other Ascension Pentecost. And then come up in the book I'm preaching. And of course, I also have you pick a book that you're preaching and uh, uh, preaching through it. You know, the day saying, well, we'll come to the Sabbath and worship. We'll talk about it then. You had your hand up again? No. no? I didn't mean again in a, in a pejorative manner. <laughs> he wouldn't open his mouth last year, and this is great. He's, he's confident now, which I like to see. He's a very good student. All right. Uh, his session. How is he exalted the right hand? He's exalted sitting at the right hand of God. In that, as God-man, he has advanced to the highest favor with God the Father. This is, this is the person now. This is the God-man advanced to the highest favor. So he's not literally there, but he's at this place of highest favor with all fullness of joy, glory, and power. So for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. Power over all things in heaven and earth been given that authority, Matthew 28, 18. Doth gather and defend his church, subdue their enemies, furnish his ministers and people gifts and graces. And we'll come back to that when we talk about his kingship and then intercession when we talk about his priesthood. All right. Um, and then, of course, he uh, is glorified in his return uh, to judge. We won't read that right now, but uh, uh, short of catechism. We can read it. 53, uh, 56. How is Christ to be exalted in his coming again to judge the world? He's exalted in his coming again to judge the world in that he who has, was justly judged and condemned by wicked men shall come at the last day in great power and in the full manifestation of his own glory and of his Father's with all his holy angels, with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God to judge the world in righteousness. So you see the framework, humiliation, exaltation. Leads us into paragraph five, and this is the work of the mediator. And it is back on page 37, where it's hooked up with Christ as prophet, priest, and king. Lord Jesus, by his perfect obedience and sacrifice of himself, which he through the eternal spirit and I take that with the confession to be uh, the Holy Spirit. Once offered up unto God, has fully satisfied the justice of his Father, purchased not only reconciliation, but an everlasting inheritance in the kingdom of heaven for all those whom the Father has given him. So we first here have, well, let me see how I put this together. So first we should look at his, uh, this work is done for the elect. And again, we see that uh, uh, that this, he's offered himself now through the Holy Spirit for his people. But let's, uh, well, the confession uh, does not deal with office of prophet. Uh, so I, I want quickly to go there, uh, 43. 
And how did Christ execute the office of a prophet? Executed the office of a prophet in his revealing to the church in all ages by his spirit and word, in divers ways of administration, the whole will of God, and all things concerning their edification and salvation. So he was the uh, eternal pre-incarnate prophet as God the Son. Uh, this is why he's called the Word. He's the angel of Jehovah. He's Adonai Jehovah, whom Isaiah saw in Isaiah chapter 6. And then as the pre-incarnate eternal Son of God, as God the Son, he gave the prophets through the Spirit their message. So that's 1 Peter 1, 10, 11, and 1 Peter 3, what, 6 through 8, or whatever it is. He, it's in the Spirit. See, people leave out context. In the Spirit, he went down to the prison house. Uh, uh, to those uh, whom he, through the Spirit he had proclaimed uh, the Word of God back in the days of Noah's uh, preaching. So he was exercising his prophetic office as the Word uh, through the Spirit uh, during the Old Covenant. And then his incarnate office as prophet uh, was to be the revealer of God by his person, his works, his teaching. And then uh, as the exalted prophet through his chosen apostles and evangelists as he has given his word now to us. And now through his spirit, he continues to exercise his prophetic ministry by illuminating our understanding. And by appointing now the office of prophet, which is a new covenant preacher who uh, Christ has appointed and by his spirit then speaks through the preacher when he preaches faithfully the word of God. That's prophet. So priest then, um, perfect obedience and sacrifice of himself. What's another term that we can use there for uh, perfect obedience and sacrifice of himself? Um, Eric? Uh, another term for perfect obedience and sacrifice of himself? Yeah, our terms. What are terms we use with Christ's obedience? His blank obedience, his blank obedience. Perfect. Impassive. Active. Your name's not Eric, I'm sure. <laughs> active and passive. So his active obedience is his fulfillment of the law in our place. That's perfect obedience. Sacrifice of himself is passive. It doesn't mean that he, he was passive, but passion. He suffered and he gave himself to that suffering uh, as the as the mediator. All right, so uh, in prophet, he taught, and the priest, um, he, what are some consequences, uh, William Johnson, of uh, Christ's priestly ministry for us? He offered himself as a sacrifice um, and reconciled his people and continues to make intercession for us. Very good. Very good. Okay. And in paragraph 8, we have something about the atonement, which is on page 44. To all those for whom Christ has purchased redemption, he does certainly and effectually apply and communicate the same, making intercession for them and revealing unto them in and by word the mysteries of salvation, effectually persuading them by his spirit to believe and obey, governing their hearts by his word and spirit, overcoming all their enemies by his almighty power, wisdom in such manner and ways as are most consonant to his wonderful and unsearchable dispensation. So according to paragraph uh, eight, um, Justin, you're not here, are you? So uh, Jonathan, uh, for whom did Christ do these things?
for everybody according to paragraph 8? Are you here, Jonathan? Must not be here. No, that's why he's not answering. I imagine that she knew he wasn't going to be here. Okay. Uh, David Melton. Also not signed on. Well, you're going to lose his smiley face. <laughs> <clears throat> well, I'm sure these guys have sent in notes. Um, Vinicius. Probably forgot the question I asked. Yeah, <laughs> so according to paragraph 8, for whom did Christ do this work of active and passive obedience? He was elect for all those little... for whom Christ had purchased. Okay. So notice the logic. All those for whom he purchased redemption, he certainly and effectually applies. So you see the connection between redemption purchased and its application. But then larger catechism 68, are the elect only effectually called, all the elect and they only are effectually called, although others may be and often are outwardly called. So it's the elect, uh, and then this lists some of the things that Christ uh, does uh, for uh, his uh, elect. What are they? Uh, Ken? Um, the Spirit causes them to believe and obey. He governs their hearts by His Word and Spirit, helping them overcome their enemies by His almighty power and wisdom. Very good. Very good. Thank Which you. Which is what was denied at the GA. <laughs> was it? By <Well>, certain <laughs> Okay. So, um, paragraph 6, although the work of redemption was not actually wrought by Christ till after his incarnation, yet the virtue, efficacy, and benefits thereof were communicated under the elect in all ages successfully from the beginning of the world in and by those promises, types, and sacrifices wherein he was revealed and signified to be the seed of the woman who should bruise the serpent's head and the lamb slain from the beginning of the world being yesterday, today, the same, and forever. This is parallels what we had back in the covenant. We talked about the old covenant administration uh, so that Christ uh, communicated the work he was going to do uh, to um, his uh, old covenant people through these various appointed forms of uh, communication. Uh, and this is because he is eternal, uh, that he... Um, is able to do that. So in that sense, he was crucified before the foundation of the world. Not that he was literally crucified, but the benefits that were going to accrue from the crucifixion began to flow to the Old Covenant uh, Church. And then after the Incarnation in 68, we've read uh, applying it to the elect and such, revealing mysteries to them, regenerating them, governing them, protecting them. And what we didn't uh, look at really in any detail is Christ's work of prophet, priest, and king. And it's a glorious uh, section. Um, and we do have a little time uh, because I uh, said we're trying to get what, halfway through, maybe get through justification tonight, and then we'll just have a little smidgen of one more class, and you don't have to do a makeup class to accommodate me. But anyway, I, I just. Uh, this stuff is so beautiful. So the question is, how did he exercise prophet, priest, and king in the states of humiliation and exaltation? So prophet, 43, Christ executed the office of a prophet and is revealing to the church. See, that's special revelation, right? We talked about that in day one. Revealing to the church in all ages by his spirit and word. He never speaks now apart from the spirit and the word and never apart from the word. In divers ways, administration, the whole will of God, and all things concerning salvation. 
Thus he was the office of a priest and has once offered himself a sacrifice without spot to God to be a reconciliation for the sins of his people and making continual intercession for them. Now if you'll flip over to Christ's exaltation, keep your finger, one finger there, and go to uh, Larger Catechism 55 on page 43. How does Christ make intercession? Christ maketh intercession by his appearing in our nature continually before the Father in heaven. In the merit of his obedience and sacrifice on earth, you see passive, active obedience, imputed righteousness, declaring his will to have it applied to all believers, answering all accusations against them, procuring, purchasing for them quiet of conscience, notwithstanding daily failings, access with boldness to the throne of grace and acceptance of their persons and services. So this is what our Savior is doing now for us. Uh, uh, lifted up in power and authority in heaven. He's there in our presence as the continual intercession that is by His perfect obedience merit that we are accepted. Uh, he is declaring His will he boldly prays in, in John 17 to have it applied to all believers, all the elect, answers any accusations against us, and then purchases quiet of conscience, which comes from assurance of salvation. Even though we'll daily sin, and access with boldness to the throne of grace. Acceptance of their persons and services. When we talk about justification, our persons are accepted, but our work is also justified. So God doesn't accept our good works because they're perfect, but because they've been washed in the blood of Christ as well. And one other phrase to direct your attention to in Arctic Catechism 53, part of his ascension. To raise up their affections thither and to prepare a place for us where himself is and shall continue until the second coming of the end of the world. So Jesus says in John 14, 3, I go to my Father and prepare a place for you. In my Father's house are many mansions. If we're not so, I would have told you. So is there a building project going on in heaven? Is this 1,500-mile cube city being constructed by Christ? And those are the dimensions in Revelation 21, uh, which I think they'll numbers in Revelation are also gone. So, um, you know, what heaven's going to be like when we're in our fortified bodies, God has not let us know. Uh, are we going to live in houses uh, with our friends and our loved ones and wives and children? Why not? Uh, live together. We're going to live out in the open. We could. We don't know. But I take this language to be much more of a spiritual preparation. And it's a figure of speech. It's, it's making us good for heaven. That's what he's doing as our prophet priest in King Tim. I was just actually quoted to someone today that John Bunyan's response to someone who asked him what heaven would be like. He'd say, go live a holy life and find out. <laughs> Okay. All right, and then... Dr. Piper. Yes. I have a question. This is Andrew Rutherford. In light of question 55, Christ's intercession, uh -huh. how ought we pray? Okay. Uh, we'll get to the Lord's Prayer and talk about that, but we pray with a conscious dependence on Him. It doesn't mean we have to say the words in every prayer in the name of Christ. But we must have the heart dependence upon Christ and should frequently uh, use those words. Is that what you're asking, Andrew? Yeah, and, you know, as an elder here at our church, I'm oftentimes kind of saddened in hearing some of our people pray as if they're coming before the throne of grace in fear of the Lord, uh, you know, negatively in fear, um, as if they're praying to a God that does not love them. Okay. Well, you know, the, the, uh, again, I hope the time you all leave here that you will um, eat, drink, sleep, a confession and catechisms. 
the larger catechism, uh, what does the preface to the Lord's Prayer teach us? That we are to pray with and for others and come boldly into the presence of God as Father, as children to a Father. And, uh, you know, our Father, which art in heaven. And so, yeah, you've got to try to undo that, my friend. Where are you, an elder? At Grace Presbyterian Church here in Aiken. Of course, I knew that, Andrew. I'm sorry. I didn't realize you were now an elder. Do you have a pastor yeah, yet? Yeah. Oh, excuse me? Has, has the church yet done anything? Uh, we are in the process of trying to call uh, Mr. Still. Well, if you don't, I'm going to come down there and blow the place up. So <laughs> Please do. <laughs> Uh, I know. I, by the way, what's the health of your father, Andrew? Um, mostly stable. He had a procedure the other week, um, so we're we're praying that it'll improve his situation. Okay. Well, remember me to the congregation, please, and to Trent and Roxanne. Absolutely. And your family. Okay. King. Forty-five, Christ executes the office of the king and calling out of the world and people to himself, giving them officers' laws and censures by which he visibly governs them, and bestowing saving grace upon his elect, rewarding their obedience and correcting them for their sins, preserving and supporting them under all their temptations and sufferings, restraining, overcoming all their enemies, and powerfully ordering all things for his own glory and their good. And also, in taking vengeance on the rest who know not God and the Baptist gospel. But my, one of my favorite answers in the Shorty Catechism is Shorty Catechism 26. Christ executes the office of the king in subduing us to himself, in ruling and defending us, and in restraining and conquering all of his and our enemies. This is what it's all about. On earth, it was the prophetic and priestly office. Now, it's the other offices are being mediated through his kingly office. As he is working in his church to extend his kingdom to the ends of the world. All right, shall we take a little break? And we'll come back and spend some time on justification. Unless anybody has questions before we leave this chapter. Yes, sir? I just have one question. Um, in what sense is Christ now taking vengeance on the rest? Now? Any time uh, that he brings... Uh, Temporal judgment, uh, yes, righteous also will be at times under that, but uh, temporal judgment uh, is uh, a vengeance on the world. Uh, tyrannical rulers, you look at the northern kingdom, I'm reading now in the end of First Kings, and God gave them one wicked king after another. Uh, people living in retirement, it's, it's part of God's judgment. And yes, it begins in the household of God. It's not that everybody who suffers in those things is wicked. But uh, I still think that 9-11 that was a judgment on our nation. Or I, I lived in California when they had the great uh, Central Valley earthquake. That supposedly, the center of that earthquake was right under one of the leading pornography studios uh, in all of America. Uh, so God does things uh, of temporal judgments like that. Um, famines, droughts, so peoples and individuals. We just must be careful. Uh, I always speak to these things when there's a, a more universal, the way Christ did, you know, all of you should repent. This is what this is for. Yes, God's has shown his judgment power so that we all will repent, not so we feel self-righteous. Good, all right, come back in five minutes. Do you know, um, I know this is, I have to tread lightly here. Do they have a modern English version of the confession? There is. Uh, it's in the, the book on the Testing Our Hope. Uh, uh, the, the, the other the recommended textbook that you had from the Chattanooga Big Storm. Yeah, and uh, Kevin uh, Bridwell has done one uh, in England. I've got some copies of it. Um, I think it, if they ask, I think it's good. I just think it needs to be a church function, not an individual. 
So now we'd want to turn the PCA loose and make the bank. That's only because we wanted to do it in the family devotion. Well, it's uh, very hard for us to go. Uh, why don't I give you one? Mm -hmm. I, well, Kevin did it, but he used that focus for the yeah. devotion. No, I, I, I've got a box of them, so since you're, I do a lot of stuff. My tenant. You're asleep. My tenant. No, <laughs> my tenant. Okay. Um, so I had a good thought. Uh, we're talking about the modern function. The OPC is doing that. Yes. So they're preparing a modern language confession. That's how it ought to be done. So it'll probably take them 10 or 15 years. It's remarkable. They got, the, I think it's because they worked with the Dutch, they got the salt and all out. So that's, I mean, really, they they, they they take their time. It really takes like 40 years to get a book of church order. Yeah. Well, that's better than the PCAs. Ours is just an evolving book of church order, so it's loosely. I was, I was wondering what you meant by earlier when you said the Trinity Salt Journal, really you knew what kind of influence was coming into it. That's good influence. <laughs> Trust. So, particularly the, I like the Canadian branch of the RC best. You do. <laughs> <laughs> Since the, the whole URC missions program is run by a uh, agreeable grad, as much as anybody can run a URC. <laughs> We're getting there. Yeah, you are. No, I think you've made good progress. So, uh, that is being done, but if you see me, I will uh, I can go, with that, go with the house. You can keep it. All right, so effectual calling. And then perhaps into justification, we should be able to do that. And then one more class and we will have made up everything. So this is now the post uh, midterm class. That's what we're up, lesson six. All right. So we first have effectual calling, which is paragraph 10. So again, we've got these transitions in the catechism. Uh, what benefits hath Christ procured by his mediation? Christ by his mediation hath procured, that means to purchase redemption with all other benefits of the covenant. Now we looked a while back at the, what are some of the benefits of the covenant? Um, Andrew. Yes. What are some of the benefits of the covenant? Some of the benefits of the covenant were our uh, are, are redemption. Uh, I'm trying to think back on. That's right. Go backwards. I just read it not that long ago. Just what are the benefits? What happens when you're saved? How are you saved? What happens when you're saved? Uh, we are saved by, we are elected, so okay. we are called. Called. And then we are brought into fellowship with, or communion with God by the Holy Spirit and fellowship with God's people. And how can that be? We're sinners. Uh, we are first uh, justified, sanctified, so we are All right. Good. made righteous. So there is the catechism question that asks what are the benefits. Um, effectual calling, justification, adoption, sanctification, um, and all the benefits accompanying the flow from them, which are assurance of God's love, peace of conscience, joy in the Holy Spirit, and Increasing grace and perseverance here in the end. So these are all things that uh, uh, belong to us by Christ's mediation as a uh, fruit of his uh, redemption. And what is the technical word uh, that we use now for the application of redemption? Ordo salutis. Ordo salutis. 
think that deserves a smiley face. <laughs> this well-trained deacon here, you see. So, what is Ordo Salutis? Order of Salvation. What is the Order of Salvation? Called, converted, justified, adopted, sanctified, glorified. Very good. Who was that? Sean. I should have known that. All right, Sean, you get a smiley face. As well. So that's very good. All right, so this is the application of redemption. So that great book by John Murray, Redemption Accomplished and Applied, he deals with what we've just dealt with in chapter 8, and the first part of that, Redemption Accomplished. And now he's moving in, he'll move into Redemption Applied. He starts with where we are right here, effectual calling. And it's out of effectual calling that all the other application uh, will flow then uh, for us. So, as I said, 58 were made partakers of the benefits which Christ hath procured by the application of them unto us, which is the work of the Holy Spirit, who were made partakers of redemption through Christ. Redemption certainly applied and effectually communicated to all those for whom Christ hath purchased it. Now, what's, what's that saying about the extent of the atonement? I, couldn't, I, I was reading uh, Moeller, who's great, but he... He mentioned one of the examples of the assembly having non-committal compromising language was the extent of the atonement. And I'm thinking, no way. I mean, it's in chapter after, you know, it had, had to be on the atonement. It's just after, after chapter. So either I misread him or he misread the confession of faith. So the redemption then is applied and fresh communicated to those for whom Christ had purchased it, who are in time by the Holy Ghost enabled to believe in Christ according to the gospel. So just as Christ came in the fullness of time, the Spirit comes in the God-appointed time to regenerate each one of us and bring us then into union with the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what happens. The union which the elect have with Christ, the union which the elect have with Christ is the work of God's grace whereby they are spiritually and mystically yet really and inseparably joined to Christ as their head and husband, which is done in their effectual calling. And so, actually, when we get to this in a few couple of weeks, Josh, is that uh, I construct the Ordo Salutis as calling conversion, union with Christ, justification, adoption, sanctification, Lord. And Murray doesn't want to put it there. He wants to let it kind of be an overarching theme because of the objective union with Christ that took place 2,000 years ago when he was on the earth. But we're talking about application of redemption. And subjective union with Christ, then, I think, is part of that, even as I think our standards say that when we're uh, effectually called, we're brought by faith then into this union uh, with the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's at the time of the appointed time of God. So now we get to paragraph one. All those whom God hath predestinated unto life, and those only he's pleased and is appointed and accepted time effectually to call by his word and spirit out of the state of sin and death in which they are by nature uh, to grace and salvation by Jesus Christ. You're on the basis of Jesus. Enlightening their minds spiritually and savingly to understand the things of God, taking away their heart of stone, giving unto them a heart of flesh, renewing their wills, and by His almighty power, determining them to that which is good, and effectually drawing them to Jesus Christ, yet so as they come most freely, being made willing by His grace. Pretty similar with Larger Catechism 67, it's the work of God's almighty power and grace. So right to the front. Now we get the power and grace of God out of his free and special love to his elect. So love now is added. From nothing in them, moving him thereunto, it's unconditional. He doth in his accepted time invite and draw them to Jesus Christ by his word and spirit. 
savingly uniting their minds, renewing power to determine their wills, so as they, although in themselves dead in sin, are hereby made willing and able freely to answer his call and to accept and embrace the grace offered and conveyed therein. All right, so uh, who does the calling then? Let's get back where we're supposed to be here. Uh, Togrel. Who is it that calls an effectual calling? Aren't you here? Yeah. Your mic's on. I don't know if you're muted. For we cannot hear you. Now you're gone. Now you're back. You're not coming through. That's always convenient. I'm speaking. Let me try again. Yes, please do. It's left. Who's <laughs> feeling? You're going to reboot, I imagine. Yeah, sometimes it messes the drivers. Greenwood's got a lot of weird drivers. So. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's true. Are there any of you tech whizzes? Uh, what are you, what are you looking for? <laughs> my, my paper tray won't shut on my printer. Initially, it wouldn't shut because I, for years, I've been printing my sermon size notebook paper in there. Goes right through. This time I decided to clog up the entire inside of the computer. So I'm getting all the jam out, and it won't. And I'm finding that there's paper right where the tray went. And I apparently have gotten all of that out, unless something went under the tray. And I don't have any way of getting that out. I know, I guess, a piece of wire or something. I think it's got to be some paper down there somewhere. I have a look. Well, look when I get home. I might just carry the best I'll fix it as I get <laughs> you already got one, didn't you get one? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, we give up on Togrel. Did you ever come back into the class? Yeah. Yeah. Speak. Uh, your answer. Ah, very Do good. Do you remember the question? <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, God calls us for salvation. Who are, uh, is, God actually any particular calls us. Any particular member of the Godhead? God the Father. Very good. And Murray makes a big point of that as well in Redemption Accomplice of Life. And that's what's being said here. So it's God the Father who, uh, according to those that he's predestinated, calls us by his power. And he does throw th through what means? Uh, huh? Word and spirit. Again, never divorced. Word and spirit. So we've seen it's the elect that are being called uh, in this manner. But now Larger Catechism 68 asks, are the elect only effectually called? All the elect and they only are effectually called, although others may be and often are outwardly called by the ministry of the word and have some common operations of the spirit who for their willful neglect and contempt of the grace offered to them, being justly left in their unbelief, do never truly come to Jesus Christ. So this is a way of dealing with what theologians will call the general call of the gospel. So Christ will say, many are called, but few are chosen. So not all who are called are of the elect. So there's a general call that goes out more promiscuously that is the free offer of the gospel. And that's the means that God uses then to send the effectual call. It's in a context of the general call. The general call can carry with it some conviction of the Holy Spirit, some illumination. We can see in Hebrews 6 uh, actually the extent of uh, what the Spirit might do in those people who are called generally uh, to the gospel, but it is not uh, a saving call because of their willful neglect and contempt of grace. They're then left in uh, their un 
uh, belief. So the, the Dr. Piper. Yes, sir. This is Andrew again. Can you explain that in light of the federal vision? Hmm. And how they well, federal, wrongly... The federal vision uh, has no place in its theology for effectual calling, which is one of the things we pointed out in the, in the controversy. Baptism uh, brings the person into a living union with Christ. So an adult would be the closest thing you would have here that this adult is called by the gospel and wants to submit to baptism. So that's what they would probably say at that point. Yes, believe in Christ, submit to baptism. It just doesn't play a great role in their system. They would say that, I'm sure. But um, baptism is the really important issue here for them. Yes. In the common workings of the Spirit, um, would Acts 26, uh, 27 be an example where King Agrippa says to Paul, in a short time, would you persuade me to be a Christian? Yeah. Where he's proclaiming the gospel. Well, let's trust he did become a Christian. But at that point, yeah, he has surely been uh, uh, generally affected by the Spirit through Paul's preaching. So God the Father calls by the Spirit through the Word. So John 6, 44, No man can come unto me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Which shows it's an effectual call. So it's not that they're going to come and fall away. Everyone that's been called by the Father will be glorified. Now how is, what, what's the work of this calling? Well, it's what we would traditionally refer to as what? So we talk about enlightening their minds spiritually, savingly to understand the things of God, taking away their heart of stone, giving unto them a heart of flesh, renewing their wills. Regeneration. Regeneration. So it is a bit of a conundrum that this is a chapter in effectual calling, and they have basically uh, merged these two uh, doctrines into one. Now they are all part of one. But they refer to all of the effects of calling. Now, one of the explanations that I've read is, is that regeneration uh, in this period and before was also used for sanctification. And so, but later on, I think the confession actually uses it in, in the more traditional way that we, we would understand it. Uh, so it's simply a part of effectual calling. It is the inward operation that takes place. Now, Murray will say, that there is the general call, the effectual call, and the regeneration to respond. But let's read this and see if you might come to a different conclusion. So what are the three things that are done for us by the Spirit then in this work of effectual calling, which is regeneration? Uh, where are we? Jeremy. Yes, sir. Did you hear the question? Yeah, yes. The Spirit enlightens our minds uh, spiritually and family to understand the things of God. Uh, it takes away the, our heart of stone and replaces it the heart of flesh. And it renews, the Holy Spirit renews our will. Okay, so. Basically, this is what Jesus said to Nicodemus, and he alluded to Ezekiel 13, uh, 36, when he said you must be born of water and the Spirit, which is the terminology then of Ezekiel 36, which is the basis of this. So he enlightens our minds, he takes away the, he changes our affections, and he renews our wills. And you see again the whole person. So our understanding, our affections, our will are all changed. Now notice the language. And yet so, all right, so, by his almighty power, determining them to that which is good and effectually drawing them to Jesus Christ. Yet so as they most, they, they come most freely being made willing by his grace. So the very language itself is suggesting a different uh, combination. 
what do you think the language is suggesting there? Anybody? The sovereignty of God. Hmm? God's sovereignty and drawing. But no, the relationship of regeneration and effectual calling. That the regeneration comes first? Yeah, so we've got what effectual calling uh, is by God. Uh, to call people out of the state of sin and misery. Then the work of it is these three things, which we would refer to as the inward operation of the spirit of regeneration, uh, determining them to that which is good and effectually drawing them to Jesus Christ. So it, it makes more sense to me, and I think it's surely the thrust of the uh, standards, that the general call goes forth, and as the spirit works then in his elect through the word, he does these three things that we call regeneration. Now, regeneration is be distinguished. It's in the subconscious. We're not aware of the action of the Holy Spirit. We're aware of the calling. But because that's happened, in the context of the call, we now are made willing and the call becomes effectual. And that's how I, I put it uh, together. Another thing to note here is that this is not someone being brought against their will. No, uh, renewing their wills, determining them of that which is good, uh, yet they must, they, they come most freely, being made willing by grace. So, TULIP is a nice acronym, but it's not the best description with respect to the atonement or effectual calling. Irresistible grace could at least give the impression that I'm coming though I don't want to come, I can't resist it. If you understand what irresistible, you don't want to resist it. That's that's the thing, and that's why effectual calling, I think, is a much better term than uh, irresistible uh, grace, which I think is the language in Dort. Yeah, yeah. Doctor Piper, is this where the language of the Puritan doctrine of preparation would apply? As far as uh, there was a book released called like prepared by grace for grace or something like that. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Um, I've seen some people represent preparationism as a false teaching, but I think there's a Puritan doctrine of preparation where the operations of grace in a person who has not yet believed that they would call that being prepared for or being brought to regeneration. Yeah, but that's not what preparation always is. It's used referring that the sinner does something to prepare himself. And I think yeah, and this, in, New this England, was in New England, that. in New England Puritanism, there probably was a strain uh, that did that. But what people like Perkins were emphasized is there must be a law work preparatory. Now he said that could take place very quickly over a long period of time. One of the places that England people went off the tracks was they measured all this out. You had to have so much of this and so much of that, and that creates that hyper Calvinism. So, uh, so there is a preparation of, of a law work. Uh, Perkins will say, you don't give the gospel until they show humility, humiliation, humility for their sin. Uh, and so that's what most English Puritans would have said, which I think is what you're asking, right? Yeah, that, that's a book that was over my head when I read it. So I, I still want to make sure I understood where it played into this conversation. Okay. Do you? I think so, but I could be wrong. All right. So, uh, and so, you guys have already emphasized this, that paragraph two, the effectual call is of God's free and special grace alone, not from anything at all foreseen in man who altogether is passive. So, you know, this is true uh, with respect to election, and it's true with respect to calling, This is the important one. No, there is the important one. All right. So it's completely of, of sovereign and free grace. Now, cases when the Spirit applies the call without the Word. We've talked about the Word and the Spirit. Paragraph 3. Elect infants, and we talked about this, right, a couple of weeks ago. Dying in infancy are regenerated. That's an important term. See, now they're using regenerated in the traditional way. 
and saved by Christ through the Spirit, who worketh when and where and how he pleaseth. So also are all other elect persons who are incapable of being outwardly called by the ministry of the Word. So two categories. So uh, infants, but notice the careful elect infants. They make no statement on all infants. Uh, now as I've said to you, I think that, and this is a statement in the Dort, there's a good reason to believe that covenant children who die in infancy are elect. Not say because they're in the covenant, but recognize that God put them in the covenant because they are elect. Uh, and I as a pastor offer that and would offer that to uh, people uh, for comfort, that their little ones are with their Lord in heaven. <clears throat> Notice who worketh when and where and how he pleaseth. And what do you think that's added here? Uh, Josh, what, why do you think it adds this uh, phrase? All right, they're saved by Christ to the Spirit, who worketh when and where and how he pleaseth. Well, I guess that could be, but we're talking now about a particular class of elect people who are converted apart from the normal means. Now, uh, one of our students here said, well, of course, they're not of the age of accountability, so they're all saved. But the age of accountability in the scripture is when a chaka knows left hand from his right hand, which is a bit before 12. Um, so, but I don't think that has anything to do with this. Uh, it's the fact that we don't define the normal way of conversion by what God does in the extraordinary and exceptional way. So that in some way they, they're regenerated, which means their nature has been changed. Which means that faith has been implanted in their heart. But how does faith operate? Through your normal faculties, right? Faith operates through your, your mind, your affections, and your will. And so faith can be there as the seed of regeneration. And then if the child had lived, that faith would have taken on of Christ for justification. But because the God's will take the child in infancy, then he has given them a new heart, he has given them faith, and he receives them and justifies them. They're not saved apart from generation and justification. They're not innocent but uh, they are safe. So, and I think that's why we have this language, where, when, where, and how he pleases. So we, we don't define justification. So uh, Steve Slissel, uh, in, in those papers that we dealt with, wants to define justification uh, out of infant salvation, and so that there's not a necessary means of faith. But we don't do our theology out of God's extraordinary when, where, and how he pleases out of the norm. So, with this paragraph, how would you pray for like two different categories of people? Um, the mentally disabled covenant children. We haven't gotten to that one yet. <laughs> I mean, it's in the paragraph, but I haven't talked about it yet. <laughs> <laughs> mentally disabled people that are not covenant children. Oh. <laughs> huh? That, I'll wait until we get to that. Oh, right, let's finish it. <laughs> I should do a smiley face, just leave me trying along there. So anyway, uh, so also are all other elect persons who are incapable of being outwardly called by the ministry of the word. So what class of person is this? I sure hope it's handicapped people. <laughs> After you ask that question. How about severely handicapped? Do, is it impolite to use the word retarded any longer? Technically. Yes. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In your circles, you're okay with this? All right, so Tim says no, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> so who, all right, so then uh, all other elect persons incapable of being called, but could this not also be uh, the noble heathen 
uh, that's uh, sincere and faithful in his religion and really wants to love and serve God. Is that referring to him as well? He's incapable of being called. Thank you for tuning in to this production of Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. For more information, please visit gpts.edu.